peace seminar series 2022 of the European Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. My name is Helga Bünning. I'm professor at Hannover Medical School and the current president of the ESGCT. The ESGCT is a nonprofit organization promoting fundamental and clinical research in gene therapy, cell therapy, and vaccines. Creating a platform for a scientific networking exchange, as well as education, is part of our mission. We therefore launched the ESGCT seminar series. Today, it's my great pleasure to announce the second seminar of our little seminar series organized in collaboration with the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. We have chosen the topic viral versus non-viral genetic engineering of T cells with three fantastic speakers. Last week, we had Marco Alessandrini from Antonia Bioscience um, who was reporting on their strategies for engineering allogenic cell therapies. Our speaker today is Dr. Dimitris Wagner from Sar Charity in Berlin. He is a physician scientist trained in immunology and genome editing. He and his team are aiming to establish platform technology for, technologies for gene editing of primary human cells and cell therapy application focusing on non-viral strategies, which is also the focus of his talk today. Dimitris is a, geno, a group leader at the BIH Center for Regenerative Therapies, head of the research and development unit at the Berlin Center of Advanced Therapies and a resident in transfusion medicine at Charity. We are now looking forward to your talk, which is entitled Virus-Free Gene Editing of T-Cells. Thank you very much, Hildegard, for the nice introduction. I'm looking forward to um, give this talk. Okay, so I'm, as Hildegard already mentioned, I'm gonna talk about virus-free uh, gene editing and especially um, show you some data on how we try to optimize virus-free CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to redirect T cells with chimeric antigen receptors. These are my potential conflict of interest. We filed patent application on CRISPR-Cas9-based cell and gene therapies, and we received reagents from integrated DNA technologies as part of an ongoing uh, collaboration. So the, the overall topic of the um, seminar series, and also I think uh, of everyone when they go to COVID uh, testing is virus or no virus. And uh, I hope to revert back to, to this small um, sentence in the end and, and make, um, try to, to put it into relation, um, our work on non-viral engineering, but what we can learn from viruses to improve virus-free technologies. So the application that we're aiming for is CAR T cell therapy. And uh, as you probably know, CAR T cell therapy is becoming a more important uh, treatment modality for patients with aggressive cancer um, month by month. Um, the whole concept of chimeric antigen uh, receptor T cell therapy is that we take T cells from the patients and then insert uh, CAR molecules, which allow the T cells to specifically recognize, for example, a cancer antigen and uh, link the antigen recognition domains directly to um, signaling domains that then mimic TCR signaling. So when we um, infuse uh, the T cells back to the patients, CAR T cells are able to specifically recognize and kill cancer cells. And uh, there are multiple commercial available um, CAR T cell therapies to date that um, all rely on um, replication deficient retroviruses for the gene transfer of these CARs uh, into, into our T cells. And um, while they have a really good um, safety record uh, with multiple decades of applications, and so far we have not seen malignant transformation, there are significant cost and time delays uh, with these um, replication deficient retrovirus because they're complex to manufacture. And um, th this really um, slows us down at these early clinical stages. Therefore, it would be nice to have a uh, gene transfer modality that does not require viruses. If you look at um, the gene transfer modalities that are out there for T-cell engineering, um, you'll find obviously retroviruses, including um, lentiviruses and gamma retroviruses are the state of the art. However, there are also virus-free um, technologies uh, like transposon, transposase um, uh, systems. There, you, we uh, um, have to deliver a DNA transposon and then transposase and en uh, enzymes allow the semi-random integration of our DNA transposon 
um, in open chromatin regions of the genomic DNA. And the most uh, important technologies out there are Sleeping Beauty and Piggyback. This is the most mature non-viral uh, T-cell engineering technology. There have been multiple trials with um, transpose engineered CAR T-cells. Um, however, recently, there have been the first reports of two um, lymphomas that developed after um, CAR T-cell therapy. Um, in, in this uh, clinical trial, the group used a hyperactive form of the piggyback transposase that uh, led to, on the one side, um, multiple integration events per, per cell type and um, also global dysregulation of the um, transcriptomic um, architecture by the transgenic promoters that are used. And, and I, I think this really pinpoints that um, in, in addition to insertional mutagenesis, by deactivation of um, tumor suppressors. Um, also, exogenous transgenic promoters pose a potential risk um, for oncogenic uh, transformation. So gene editing is a, a new technology that allows us to specifically modify precise regions in the genome through a programmable nucleases. And the most um, commonly known uh, programmable nucleases are zinc finger nucleases, talens, and of course uh, CRISPR-Cas9. And gene editing is what we are currently working on to create um, um, new CAR T cell products. My favorite, um, Programmable, nu uh, programmable nuclease is CRISPR-Cas9. And CRISPR-Cas9 uh, was originally derived from bacteria and um, uh, Jennifer Dutner and Emmanuel Charpenty received a Nobel Prize for um, their discovery that we can actually exploit the system um, as, a, as an engineered uh, nuclease. The system is uh, basically a two component um, system that on the one side um, has the, the Cas9 protein, which has nucleus function, and on the other side has these guide RNAs that um, have a one part which allows them to bind to the Cas9 protein, and on the other side, um, these small guide RNAs have target sequences which we can engineer to then make this complex specific for almost any point in the human genome. When we mix, mix these two components, the complex um, uh, forms and um, this complex can then search the genomic DNA in cells by interaction with so-called PAM motifs, so protospace adjacent motifs, for the most commonly used Cas9 that was derived from the bacterium Streptococcus pyogenes. That is just two Gs and it can potentially be found every um, seven to eight base pairs in the human genome. So, so this complex tries to in, uh, interact with PAM motifs and if the guide RNA target sequence then uh, aligns with, with what we engineered it to. Um, the complex can unwind the DNA, locks in place, and then activates um, nuclear, its nucleus domains and then leads to a double strand break. And this is actually what we um, exploit for gene editing. So the nucleus just cuts, but then we, we exploit the endogenous DNA repair of the cell to introduce changes. For example, if we target our RNP complex to a protein coding gene, then the, the cell will try to re repair the DNA double strand break with, for example, non-homologous end joining, which is a very efficient and fast um, DNA repair yeah. mechanism, but doesn't have proofreading function. And therefore, um, repetitive cutting of the CRISPR-Cas9 complex can lead to small insertions and deletions, and we can use this to knock out genes. And uh, we and others have shown that um, especially electroporation of um, uh, CRISPR RNPs can be used very efficiently to delete genes uh, in T cells with, with CRISPR-Cas9. On the other side, we can also exploit homologous uh, recombination. So if we co-deliver a DNA donor template that is designed to be highly similar to the uh, point where we introduce the DNA double strand break, we can actually trick the cells uh, into uh, um, inserting new transgenes at a precise um, location. And this is, of course, what is important for um, delivering, for example, a CAR transgene into the T cell. And there have been numerous reports um, showing that CRISPR-Cas9 can be used to use uh, HDR to correct mutations and insert uh, new transgenes. So the most important question when you want to insert something uh, big transgene, such as a car, um, we have to uh, figure out what, what we use as um, our DNA donor template system. 
The most established system for delivery of DNA repair templates are adeno-associated viruses. And there have been many examples where people have electroporated T cells with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 ribonucleoprotein particles and then transduced them with AABs that then delivered um, HDR repair template in the form of single-stranded DNA to the nucleus um, to, to perform a transgene knock-in. However, AV at the complexities of viral manufacturing, which we want to avoid. And therefore, we aim to look at um, virus-free alternative. For example, double-stranded DNA, which can be circular, uh, for example, in, in the form of a plasmid, or linear, produced by, uh, by enzymes, for example, a simple PCR reaction, and also a single-stranded DNA. In our hands, single-stranded DNA is hard to produce and um, has not been um, so efficient. That's why we decided on using uh, DNA, uh, double-stranded DNA, and um, um, in particular linear uh, DNA templates because they avoid any bacterial backbones and can be easily scaled through simple PCR reactions in the lab. We started working on the system um, two and a half years ago, and luckily at the time there were already um, great uh, protocols out there. In particular, the group by um, Alexander Maaßen um, with, with the lead author, Theo uh, Roth, have um, already shown uh, the world that if you co-electroprate ribonucleoprotein with linear DNA um, donor templates, you can specifically insert small stretches of DNA in T cells very effectively. And the way you do it is you just Take your um, RMP complex, you mix this uh, with a linear double-stranded DNA, which you can make easily in the lab, and you mix this together with activated T cells, electroporated in this Lonza 4D nucleofactor device. And then after subculture, you can, you can analyze your successful gene editing. So Jonas, uh, an MD in my lab, who's currently pursuing his PhD, um, set out to establish this platform to generate um, CAR T cells. And the first thing we did is we decided for a locus and we decided for the TCR alpha chain locus, in particular the first exon of the constant part of the TCR alpha chain, which is short um, track. So he designed a DNA template um, that uh, entailed approximately 400 base pairs um, homology regions to um, the upstream part of the our, our uh, target cut site and 400 base pairs downstream. And then he inserted a transgene consisting of a 2A cleavage site and uh, the CAR and a transcription terminator sequence. So after successful gene editing, what we would aim to have is an in-frame inserted um, CAR gene. However, after translation um, of the, the mRNA, um, the, the 2A sequence will generate a truncated dysfunctional TCR alpha chain protein, which is unable to form a fully functional T cell receptor on the surface. But instead, we have a, a fully functional CAR protein. And um, for our optimizations, we use the second generation CD19 specific CAR um, that in, entails a CD19 specific binder on the extracellular and a CD28 transmembrane on co-stimulatory domain and a CD3 zeta, which mimics TCR activation. So by this approach, we can really redefine the T-cell specificity for CD19. And CD19 is commonly overexpressed on B-cell malignancies like B-cell leukemia or lymphoma. And on the same time, we eliminate potentially allorective T-cell receptors. And that is nice because this potentially opens the development of CAR T-cells as an allogenic off-the-shelf product. So first question, of course, how good uh, are other groups when they're trying to insert these therapeutically relevant transgenes such as transgenic TCRs or CARs? So if we look at the original publication by uh, Roth and colleagues, we find that they've already supplied proof of principle that this can be used. And they actually inserted um, tumor antigen specific TCR which added up to a total transgene insert size of 1.5 kb. And um, in, in this uh, figure three, you can find that the um, insertion rate was 12.3%. Um, the same group published um, another report um, approximately uh, yeah, uh, a few months later, together with um, the, the team of Dirk Busch in Munich. And there they used the same technology to insert a full TCR alpha and beta chain, which sums up to a total transgene insert of 2.1 um, uh, kb. 
And with this strategy, they only achieved approximately 5% um, knock-in in, in, in the T-cells. And that is a relevant number for us because this is approximately the size that our car insert has. So we took the original protocols that we received from Theo Roth and uh, Alexander Mass, and we tried to optimize uh, to optimize it. And uh, we, we took on the challenge to, for example, reduce the, the need for expensive materials and came up with an, an optimized um, a version. And it generally goes like this. The first thing that we need to do is collect blood and isolate peripheral blood mononuclear cells where we have the T cells in. Then we usually in, enrich the T cells by um, um, magnetic, um, um, enrichment uh, strategy. And then we take the T cells and we um, stimulate them for two days in the presence of growth stimulating cytokines on anti CD3, anti CD28 coated um, wells. And this really promotes polyclonal stimulation. The cells will start to um, proliferate and, be, um, um, and um, uh, go into a cell cycle phase where they're more. Um, where, where homology directed repair can happen. And this is usually after two days. And in two days, we really use electroporation to transfect um, RMP for a truck and uh, the double stranded DNA um, repair template. And then, as early as two days after electroporation, we can perform flow cytometry to then check for the expression of the TCR and for the car. And this is some exemplary um, flow cytometry data. So uh, T cells usually all express the TCR and the CD3 on the surface. So they are CD3 positive as indicated here, but of course they usually don't express a car molecule. That's why you can't find any dots here um, because there's no car present. If we um, electroporate the RNP only, then we perform a, a knockout of the TCR alpha chain. And as you can see, um, most of the cells then don't express the TCR anymore and are TCR um, negative. Only if we add the CRISPR-Cas9 ribonucleoprotein complex and the DNA repair template, we can then find this population down on the, on the lower right quadrant that then express the car, but um, um, in, in the TCR negative um, cells. And this is actually what we want to achieve and what we will quantify in the following data. So with our optimized protocol, we first wanted to know what is the optimal dose of DNA that we need to transfect to get um, a good yield of CAR T cells. So we, uh, Jonas titrated the amount of DNA from very low to really high amounts. And then two days later, we performed flow cytometry to see how, um, how many cells we generated and how many of those actually had the CAR. What we can see is that with um, rising amount of double-stranded DNA here on the x-axis, we can actually achieve higher car knock-in results. And, and this is really the more DNA you use, the higher the knock-in um, um, gets. However, this increase in the knock-in really comes at significant cost because we observe a strong dose-dependent toxicity after the electroporation of double-stranded DNA. What this means is the more DNA you electroporate, the less cells survive two days after um, electroporation. And if you then calculate out of these two, um, two, two numbers, the absolute CAR T cell yield, you'll find this really beautiful optimal dose window where we have a perfect balance between effective knock-in of the car and moderate toxicity. And as you can see here, for us, this was between 0 0.5 and one microgram per electroporation and per electroporation, we usually electroporate 1 million T cells. So our data clearly shows that double-stranded DNA is really a key determinant of the um, toxicity that we observe in this non-viral gene editing. And this could be theoretically due to two reasons. On the one side, it could be due to the physical stress of electroporating these large DNA CRISPR-Cas9 aggregates into the cells. Potentially, this could disrupt membranes or, or um, hurt the cells um, and directly through physical um, distraction. On the other hand, we hypothesize that also innate immune responses um, could, um, could be a problem because the cell is flooded with double-stranded DNA and this double-stranded DNA could potentially induce a danger signal similar to what cells um, experience during viral infection or um, a massive tissue damage. So we wanted to look at the innate immune re um, response and whether we can do something about this. 
Double-stranded DNA is sensed by cells through different mechanisms, and these are just some of the, 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 the ones which are very established in, um, in the field. There's obviously AIM-2, which can activate the inflammasome and lead to the uh, production of IL-1 beta, but um, another really central um, mechanism for a double-stranded DNA recognition is CGAS, which then activates STING, and STING can lead to the production of inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 or TNF-alpha, can lead to direct apoptosis or cell cycle uh, rest or the uh, type 1 interferon response. So we analyzed the uh, supernatants of the cells that we electroporated with um, increasing amounts of double-stranded DNA 24 hours after the electroporation and then looked for cytokines that were associated with DNA sensing. And what you can see is um, IL-1-beta was um, at the limit of the detection of the assay, so that we couldn't really see any effect. However, when you look at IL-6 and also TNF-alpha, you can see at the larger amount of double-stranded DNA, we can see more of these cytokines, which at least um, uh, indicate that maybe DNA sensing is going on and that potentially contributes to, to some of the toxicity that we've observed. So obviously we want to do something about it. So we um, investigated molecules that could potentially inhibit these pathways of innate uh, DNA sensing. And we identified uh, two molecules, um, ODN A151, which is a nucleic acid, which just mimics telomere repeats, and a small molecule inhibitor of CGAT, which is called WU521. And in our preliminary results, these two components looked really promising, and that's why we decided to combine them. The way we adapted our um, protocol is the following. So, um, we, we saw that um, DNA sensor inhibition works best if the cell is exposed to these uh, inhibitors before they are exposed to the DNA. So what we do is, um, what we did was we, we treated the cells um, six hours before we took the cells with, uh, for electroporation. We added these uh, two inhibitors to the medium in a hope to really saturate these DNA sensors before the electroporation. And um, we hope that this would uh, increase mm -hmm. the cell viability um, after, after um, electroporation. Unfortunately, this was not really the, the case. What we would have hoped to, to, to see would have been that here this orange line would actually increase for all the DNA uh, amounts. And um, we, we hope that this could allow us to actually use larger amount of DNA to get higher knock-in um, um, uh, and higher CAR T cell yield. But what you can see is the survival was only um, improved at this low amount of 0 0.5 microgram and not even quite significantly. If you look at the overall CAR T cell yield, we still saw a significant increase in the amount of T cells, but this was at least partially um, due to a relative increase in the knock-in. And we haven't totally figured out why DNA sensing increases the knock-in, and this is something that we're currently um, looking into. But basically we see a slight increase in cell survival paired with an increase in knock-in that increases the CAR T cell yield, but only at low DNA amounts. We also looked at DNA uh, um, um, sensing associated cytokines, and there you can see that we actually could see um, a, a suppression of IL-6 release um, by this DNA uh, um, sensor inhibition uh, treatment. However, when you look at TNF-alpha, you, you see that we couldn't affect it. So we, we reasoned that our DNA um, sensor inhibition that we perform is only partly effective, also um, measured by these cytokines. So as a first quick summary, we believe that during non-viral um, gene editing, double-stranded DNA is really the main driver of toxicity, and that is at least partially due to classical intracellular DNA sensing. Um, we, we found that we cannot really prevent uh, the, the DNA toxicity by the inhibitors that we use, which um, points us to, to the fact that we have to work with these low amounts of double-stranded DNA if we want to generate large amount of uh, CAR T cells with this technology. If we only can use these low amounts of DNA templates, we thought, well, could we maybe modulate the DNA repair mechanism 
to pharmacological favor HDR as an outcome of the, the gene editing um, procedure. And this is where a collaboration with integrated DNA technology comes in. Ashley Jacoby and her team had really promising data in, in cell lines, and we set out to, uh, to um, test their um, HDR enhancers that they have developed in the lab. So HDR enhancers affect uh, DNA repair. And um, we found that, that the most efficient use of HDR enhancers is um, if, you, if we electroporate the cells with the RNP and the DNA, and then add the cells directly into medium that is supplemented with these um, um, small molecules that, that modulate DNA repair. And what we can see there then is, if you look at the, the uh, car, car knock-in rates, is if we add HDR enhancer version one mm. in rising doses, we can really see a dose-dependent increase in the relative knock-in rates. And HDR enhancer version two seems to be even more efficient, while um, DMSO, which is the solvent for both of these small molecules, didn't affect um, the, the car knock-in rate. And this really shows HDR enhancers are a powerful tool to increase the relative um, knock-in rates. We also used uh, or, or learned some important lessons if you want to try HDR enhancers for T-cell engineering. So the first lesson that we learned was that we have to warm the medium um, that, that the cells are uh, transferred to after the electroporation if we want to see an effect of the HDR enhancers. So um, in this one experiment, we, we um, added our freshly electroporated T-cells to um, uh, medium that was um, supplemented uh, with HDR enhancer version one or two, but the, the medium was not um, warmed. And you can see that you don't really see an increase in the car knock-in rate, while the base knock-in rate was still really high with approximately 30%. Second important lesson was that we, we have to transfer the cells um, relatively fast after the nucleofaction into, um, into HDR enhancer containing medium. After, um, if we wait approximately 10 minutes, which is our standard uh, procedure, um, we, we can see this nice increase with both HDR enhancer version one and um, HDR enhancer version two. However, if we extend the uh, resting period after electroporation before we add it to the HDR enhancers, this effect dramatically drops. So if you want to, to use this, transfer your um, uh, cells fast to these, to these HDR enhancers. And then an important lesson that we believe can be exploited to further um, optimize this approach is that three hours exposure to the HDR enhancers seems to be enough. And based out of these three lessons, I, I think we can conclude that the DNA repair the decisions um, that, that happen or are made in these cells actually um, are determined within the first minutes to few hours after electroporation. So the first hours really count to uh, um, determine the genome editing outcome after, um, after gene editing. So of course, an obvious question now is we, um, we have the DNA sensor inhibition approach, which increased the CAR T cell yield at least a little bit. We have the HDR enhancers. Can we combine these two approaches? And, and this is what we tried. So we uh, supplemented the medium and the T cells with the DNA sensor inhibition six hours prior to electroporation, then took those cells, transfected them, and after transfection, we added them into HDR containing medium and then uh, checked whether we can see a, um, a synergistic effect. And to make a long story short, yes, we can see that um, regardless of how much HDR enhancer is used, the DNA sensor inhibition always increases the relative knock-in rates. And uh, you can see up here in this one donor, we achieved up to 68% CAR positive cells after um, electroporation um, with, with this non-viral system. And this is really our current record um, for, for CAR reprogramming with this approach. However, to paint an honest picture, we also have to look at the um, overall CAR T cell counts. And there you can see that this really dramatic increase in the relative knock-in does not translate into many more CAR T cells. And that is because uh, HDR enhancers are toxic at, at a larger dosages. So again, here there is an optimal dose, which is in the lower, lower end of, or the lower concentration levels of um, HDR enhancer one, and also HDR enhancer version two. So now we've meddled with these T cells by uh, a lot of different drugs. And of course, uh, a very important um, question is, do these drug treatments affect the functionality of our T cells? 
So Jonas performed um, two assays that we commonly do in the lab, and one is looking at um, cytotoxicity. So we use a flow cytometric-based uh, uh, vital assay, where we um, co-culture our CAR T cells with two types of cancer cells. One is the um, target cell that expresses the antigen of choice. In our case, we use the CD19-specific CAR T cells, then we use CD19-expressing NALMSIC leukemia cell line that expresses GFP as a target cell line. And then as a control cell line, we use another um, uh, cancer cell line that does not express um, the antigen of choice. In this case, we use the Jurkat um, cell line that does not express CD19. And we label this cell line with um, cell trace far red so we can distinguish these two populations in the co-culture. And what you can see is that if you add um, control uh, T cells that had TCR knockout or uh, the wild type cell, you can see that in, in this experiment, we had approximately 60% target cells and 40% control cells. But um, after four hours exposure to uh, um, truck CD19 car knock-in T cells, you can see that the um, percentage of um, NALM6 positive cells decreases, and this is summarized here for multiple effector to or T cell to target cell ratio. And we can really see a nice dose dependent relative killing. And this is not significantly altered by the different um, DNA sensor inhibition, HDR enhancers, or both drug treatments. Next question is, are our T cells after these different drug treatments still able to secrete inflammatory cytokines that are important for cancer control? So we performed um, um, uh, an assay to look at intracellular cytokine production to this end. T cells were mixed with cancer cells that express the antigen of choice. Here we used NALM6 cells again, and then we um, blocked the, um, the secretion of these cytokines by Brefeld DNA and performed flow cytometry and stained these cytokines kinds TNF alpha, IL-2, and interferon gamma intracellularly. And this is a SPICE analysis. And what this shows is that um, our CAR T cells actually express um, TNF alpha here in, 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 in blue, IL-2 in orange, and interferon gamma in yellow. And actually, approximately 15% of the cell actually express all of these three cytokines. And only about a third doesn't express any uh, cytokines whatsoever. And the, the distribution of these different cytokines is very similar, regardless of the, uh, if these CAR T cells were treated with HDR, hence a DNA sensor inhibitor of both. And while our control uh, T cells, the cells with the TCR knockout or the wild type T cells were unable to produce any cytokines whatsoever. So as a summary for this part, um, we believe that transient DNA sensor inhibition could be a new way to improve gene editing in primary human T cells. We've also tried this uh, with the help of IDT in, in cancer cell lines, but there it doesn't really seem to work. And that's probably because um, cancer cell lines already are defective uh, in DNA sensing. We believe that the inhibitors that we found so far are not the best there. We believe that they're more important uh, or, or better um, inhibitors or inhibitor cocktails uh, needed to, to really exploit this, this uh, DNA sensor inhibition for optimal CAR T cell recovery. We've shown that HDR enhancers are really a powerful uh, tool to improve HDR with large inserts such as CAR. And uh, importantly, we also analyzed um, the, the effect on potential off-target site. And um, we, we did not see an effect of these DNA enhancers on, on uh, off-targets um, because we could not um, uh, detect a single um, off-target um, by NGS. We combined um, DNA sensor inhibition, HDR enhancers, and we, we could show that synergistically they improve the CAR T cell yield. It is not dramatic. It's just 1.2 to a twofold increase in the overall CAR T cell yield, but this is a good, good uh, way to, to, to start uh, it in the future. And we could show that neither of those drugs had effects on CAR T, T cell function and also phenotype. I didn't show you that, but um, uh, they, they didn't change the phenotype in vitro. So an obvious question is now, okay, um, I, I hope you believe me now that we, we are able to generate these um, um, TCR replaced CAR T cells via virus-free gene editing, but of course we have to compare to the state of the art and that are uh, CAR T cells that are generated by lentiviral transduction. 
So Wager in the lab, a postdoc in the lab, um, looked at, at this from a more a functional angle. And she generated um, CD19 CAR T cells either by truck knock-in with our virus-free approach or by lentiviral transduction using an expression cassette that contained an ear for an alpha promoter. And if you just look at the CAR expression here measured by this NTFC antibody, you can really see that the truck uh, knock-in CAR T cells have a lower CAR expression, and you can also see this in the mean fluorescent intensity analysis down here. So lentivirally transduced CAR T cells have a higher CAR expression, and uh, we hypothesize that this could um, lead to, to higher um, um, uh, exhaustion. So what, what Wage did was to perform a, a tumor uh, cell rechallenge assay. So she took the different uh, CAR T cells after truck knock-in or after lentiviral transduction and stimulated them um, four times every 12 hours with NALM6 or CD19 positive tumor cells. And then after six hour uh, total assay, she analyzed the uh, expression of, um, or of um, surface markers that are commonly associated with T cell exhaustion and dysfunction. And uh, here's a spice analysis of that, looking at the expression of LUC3, PD1, and TIM3. And what you can um, definitely see here, there's a big proportion of the CD4 lentiviral transduced CAR T cells that are black. That means they express all of those um, exhaust markers, while this proportion is much slow, uh, smaller in the gene edited CAR T cells highlighting that potentially our TCR replaced CAR T cells are less prone to exhaustion in vitro. Next question is, of course, how do our truck knock-in CAR T cells perform um, compared to the lentiviral transduced CAR T cells in a challenging in vivo model? And here we're really thankful that the group of um, Renata Strippecke at Hanover Medical supported us. Um, uh, Tobias Braun and Alina, actually, Alina Brune carried out uh, this experiment. Um, they used immunodeficient energy mice and um, transplanted them with um, um, half a million NALM6 uh, leukemic uh, cells that were labeled with GFP and uh, luciferase. And then after four days, we injected um, a very small amount of CAR T cells, just a, a half a million CAR T cells after the leukemia cell line had already time to spread in the mouse. And then we looked at... Um, the leukemia growth by uh, monitoring bioluminescence uh, and uh, uh, for for five weeks and looked which CAR T cells can control the, um, the the leukemia growth better. So as expected, if you look at mice that only received the tumor, you can see here nicely that they have this um, bioluminescence uh, signal, and um, at the first week, actually, uh, we we don't really see a big difference. Um, um, regarding uh, the, the amount of leukemia that, that uh, can be visualized um, if we have the, or if we added the lentiviral CAR T cells or the truck knock-in CAR T cells. They all started more or less the same. And this is just three days after we applied the T cells. Then in the, um, in the coming weeks, you can see that the, the leukemia signal is definitely increasing the tumor only control. And it is increasing faster in the tumor only than in the lentiviral uh, generated CAR T cells. There you can see some mice uh, actually um, uh, experience um, slowed leukemia expansion. However, at week, week five, you can see that the leukemia is spreading drastically in all of those four mice. Our truck in CD19 CAR T cells perform very similar to the lentiviral CAR T cells. However, we see a hint towards potentially um, higher, um, higher effect, um, uh, or um, improved uh, leukemia control. As you can see here, the uh, final um, um, bioluminescence signal is much lower in these two animals than these four animals here on the left. And if you look at the summary data, um, and if you compare the tumor-only condition against uh, the different intervention calls at, the, um, at week five, only the Lenti, uh, the, the gene edited CAR T cells are, have significantly lower tumor burden um, than, than the tumor only condition. So at least this is a hint towards maybe an improved um, function of our virus free gene edited CAR T cells. However, what we can include, uh, definitely conclude is that they are not inferior to lentivirally uh, generated CAR T cells. 
So as a, as a um, more or less last uh, summary um, um, of the data, I, I, I hope that I could convince you that virus-free gene editing is a really promising platform for rapid, uh, affordable, and scalable engineering of, of adoptive uh, T-cell therapy. Um, potentially, we can use this for autologous application. Uh, and there, um, the virus-free approach could uh, help us to reduce the cost at early clinical stages because it's just uh, cheaper to produce um, GMP-compatible uh, DNA um, donor DNA. And then potentially, for example, through the TCR replacement approach, we can also use this non-viral gene editing um, technology to develop allogenic off-the-shelf T cells. However, the question is, will this be enough or do we need additional um, genetic modifications? We could show that pharmacological interventions can be used to enhance the virus-free TCR um, replaced CAR T cell generation, but I believe that there are better drugs out there. We need better cocktails to really um, um, use this um, in, in the clinics. And of course, if we want to use these drugs, they have to be available at uh, GMP um, um, uh, grade. So that there must be um, documentation that we can actually use them um, in, in clinical protocols. So as an outlook for virus-free um, gene editing in T cells. I, I think it's good to, to look back at what are the different DNA donor formats that we can use as templates for HDR-mediated knock-in of CARs or TCRs or any other genetic cargos. I, I think what, what we really need as a, as a community would be a really fair comparison between AAV, double-stranded DNA, and also single-stranded DNA. AAV, of course, has an advantage because we don't need to to um, perform electroporation. Um, the, the AAV goes into the cells um, through evolutionary selective mechanisms, right? It, it's a, an easier approach. However, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA always have to be um, um, transferred um, by, by some means, and that could be, for example, electroporation. I think it will be very interesting to, to revisit single-stranded DNA. I told you in our lab, we've tried this and single-stranded DNA alone as a HDR template did not work well in our hands. However, there was a recent preprint again by the lab of Alexander Maaßen that showed that uh, you, they, they can increase um, the um, delivery of single-stranded DNA donors by attaching um, small oligos and uh, shuttle uh, sequences so that um, the CRISPR-Cas9 com uh, complex can actually put single-stranded DNA and pull it into the nucleus um, of the cells actively. And um, I, I think this is a really interesting modality to decrease the toxicity as single-stranded DNA is much smaller than double-stranded DNA. And, um, this might be an interesting modality to improve virus-free T-cell engineering in the future. Then I think an important um, uh, new technology that, that we will see in the coming uh, years is actually the marriage between two existing technologies. On the one side, uh, we, we've talked about that gene editing uh, is site-specific and this could be an advantage because we've seen the leukemic transformation in the uh, transposon engineered um, CAR T cells, but actually it would be optimal to combine these two technologies or the benefits of these two, uh, two technologies and there, for example, CRISPR integrases are coming up. These are enzymes that um, combine the specificity of gene editing with the cargo capacity of transposase technology. And to add in there, with HDR, we're really limited in the amount that we can transfer by the mechanisms that govern HDR. So um, potentially it would be nice to, for example, um, uh, engineer T cells that are, are not dividing. And for this, we would need another technologies and um, CRISPR integrases, CRISPR recombinases or CRISPR transposes might be a mean to, uh, to, to really achieve that in the future. I would like to finish the small presentation by coming back to this original question, virus or not virus. And I, I, I think, um, Virus-free alternatives are definitely on the rise. Um, they increase our flexibility in the engineering of T-cells. They could potentially lower the costs of um, uh, T-cell engineering for therapeutic applications. But there's a lot that we can learn from viruses. And I think I touched it at, at some point um, before. I think AAV has this unique advantage that it, it can directly access the cell uh, through through this evolutionary selected mechanisms. And we don't need this blunt force transfection approach. 
And um, I, I think this is really where, where AAV has an advantage in, in um, uh, uh, engineering because the delivery is more smooth and less toxic. If we can learn from that and, for example, use um, lipid nanoparticles or virus like uh, virus-like particles to package our DNA, then maybe we can make virus-free gene editing even um, better. And then maybe it will be uh, a complete or a technology that completely replaces viruses in the future. However, I think that's, uh, sets, uh, that is a question of the future. With this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And I would like to uh, give a shout out to the amazing scientists I have the pleasure to work with. I um, would like to uh, thank everyone in, in my uh, really growing lab in the last couple of years. I have to thank um, my supervisors who supported this development, Petra Reinke, Hans-Dieter Falk, and also Michael schmuck Enneres at, at Charité. And of course, all the collaborators that helped uh, in generating the data that I've presented you um, today. And with this, I would be happy to uh, um, uh, discuss with you all and answer any questions you might have about the data that I've shown you. So thank you very much, uh, Dimitris. This was fantastic, uh, sharing all these data and information. And uh, before I start with the first question, I would like to remind the audience that you can ask questions, just type it into the chat and I will receive this and can ask Dimi. So let us go for the first questions. So um, Nicolas Sandoval from the Pi is asking, or well, first of all, thank for this very nice talk. And then could a combination of other molecules maybe also acting elsewhere in the DNA sensing pathway to help to improve survival? Yes, I, I think that is a very good point. Um, it, I, I personally believe so that um, there are many untapped pathways that we could explore. Our um, knowledge on DNA sensing is really just starting to evolve. And uh, since we started working on this, I think there have been um, two or three new DNA sensing pathways that were discovered. So I, I think there are definitely other cocktails that could potentially be used to, to, to do that. There are, Aside from DNA sensing, I think there are also other pathways that one can imagine that might be beneficial to um, at least transiently inhibit. And this could be, for example, DNA damage response. It could be um, um, apoptosis genes to, to really transiently block um, cell death um, so, so um, that, that we can improve um, gene editing outcomes. I, I totally agree. I think there will be new and exciting compounds that, that we need to discover for this kind of work. Thanks. Kirill Alepic is asking, or first of all, also thank you for your fantastic talk. And then one detail he would like to know, what electroporator device do, uh, did you use in these experiments? So all of our experiments were done with the LONSA 4D nucleofactor. Um, we have started working with other um, electroporation systems. We used to work with a neon transfection system um, from Thermo Fisher. That didn't really work well for us. Another system that we've worked with successfully is also the Maxide system. Um, and many people are working on optimizing these technologies for Maxide as well. But for us, it was the Lanza 4D nuclear factor, and we're happy to share protocols um, if you're interested in trying them. Thanks. Kirill is also asking um, in, if you could please uh, comment um, if you perform a codon optimization or have particular, particular structure modification in your double-stranded DNA donors. That is a, is a great question. So we always perform codon optimization for our inserts. And I actually personally believe that um, this is a very important point because what we have observed is that um, different DNA templates have different toxicity. And on the one side, this can be explained by the, the final size of the DNA template. So the bigger you make your DNA template, the more toxic it will be. That is something that we and others have seen um, all the time. However, what, what we have observed in our data when we try different car constructs, uh, different codon optimizations was also that some DNA inserts um, seem to be more toxic to T cells than others and are less efficiently integrated. And I think this will be really um, exciting to find out why certain DNA uh, sequences 
um, are more toxic to T cells or are, uh, you know, or are integrated in a better way. Because exactly what you say, I think that um, certain structures might actually be beneficial for these um, for, for, for gene editing outcomes. And if, if we can predict um, good structures, we might be able to insert them during codon optimization. Um, and if there are ones that we know um, are associated with, with a lot of toxicity, we can try to use codon optimization to get rid of those. But, but this is still work in progress. And um, I, I think this will be instrumental to figure out to make this um, technology really stable across different uh, CAR or TCR uh, um, uh, trends. Thanks. For the next question, we visit uh, the topic of single-stranded DNA. And Yang Liu would like to know um, if there is any specific requirement in this regard, so that it is a plus or a minus trend or something like that. That is a good point. So we've tested um, single-stranded DNA uh, in the lab. And um, for us, there is no real way to predict which one works better for a small insert. I think uh, you, you just have to try it uh, out. For the large insert, it seems that uh, antisense or sense did not really impact um, the, the knock-in e efficacy much. However, when you when you talk about single-stranded DNA, I, I really have to say that if you just use single-stranded DNA HDR donors without any modifications, then in our hands, it's much less efficient than, than double-stranded DNA. So for example, if we use half a microgram of double-stranded DNA uh, template and then exactly the same template, but a single-stranded DNA and exactly the same amount of DNA, so half a microgram, which is actually more than two times the uh, uh, molecules, then the, the difference is 25% knock-in with double-stranded DNA, around 5% with single-stranded DNA. So if you use unmodified single-stranded DNA, I, I think you will always end up with um, a less efficient knock-in. However, please check out the, the preprint by the Marsden lab. They have added these small modifications to the um, HDR uh, donor ends that you can include to really increase um, the, the delivery of single-stranded DNA. And at least in our hands, this really increases the knock-in with single-stranded DNA. Thanks. We have now two questions from uh, Vlad Sergev. First of all, he says, great presentation. And now the first question, did you find any random DNA integration in your optimal conditions? So um, we, we have um, not looked at it in depth, um, how or if we can have um, random integration. So with double-stranded DNA, I would expect that there will be random integration, but at least um, I uh, consider it to be um, really low. and that. That consideration comes from the fact that um, our collaborator integrated DNA technologies has used long read sequencing over our on-target locus. So at our on-target locus, we have a lot of double-strand breaks. And of course, it can be used for HDR, but theoretically, it can also be used for non-homologous end-joining mediated insertion into the truck locus. So then we would have the entire HDR template there. And at least that was less than 1%. Um, and uh, that, that was at the lower limit of the detection. So we could detect it, but it was less than 1%. And that is at the site where we have a lot of double strand breaks. So I, I think the, um, the risk for random integration at uh, random double strand breaks will be low. However, it's a very good point and needs to be considered for clinical development. Thanks. And the second talk is looking into the future. Did you try to perform large-scale production, for example, in a Clidimax prodigy system or something similar? Um, so, so we have scaled this protocol um, with, uh, with manual labor, and it works. So we can actually expand um, uh, 500 to 250 fold uh, CAR T cells using this, uh, this approach from healthy donors. We have not done this uh, extensively mm -hmm. with patient material. I think this will be uh, another clue. Looking at optimization, I think that is a very important point that needs to be addressed in the future. I know we have a collaborator that has used uh, some of our uh, methods uh, in a prodigy system with, um, with some success. But since this is not our uh, primary work, I cannot comment on, on the details of that. Thanks, but maybe we can stay in that area a minute. So with regard to when we think about the clinical application, when it comes to patient cells, so how long do you think your whole procedure would, uh, would take? 
So our manufacturing um, um, uh, protocol is 12 days. And um, I personally believe that it would be beneficial for at least for autologous applications to limit the, um, the, um, the amount of time that these cells are in cell culture. I think this has now become a mainstream um, uh, idea that limiting the amount of um, expansion outside the body um, can, can improve the performance of these cells. So we've seen Novartis has now the program with just I think a 24 or 48 hour uh, production cycle. I personally believe in Germany that would be really hard to do with the regulatory of, um, authorities using a retroviral system because the retroviral will definitely be around for 24 hours after um, after transduction. The virus free system, however, I, there we can show that after two days, most of the RNP is gone and uh, the DNA is around longer. So I think um, with virus free systems, we have a really great opportunity to limit um, the, the production um, times. Of course, for allogenic products, um, for an allogenic approach to be viable, you have you need to make a lot of cells and you make to, uh, to, to make multiple products from a, a single donor. Otherwise, it just it, the, the advantages um, are, are too 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 small. If we have to make one healthy donor product, then the, the performance will be inconsistent, uh, I believe. So so I think for allogenic approaches, we will use longer expansion protocols. Thanks. Um, I don't see any further questions. So again, also in line with all our uh, um, speaker, uh, all our uh, people from the audience, I really would like to thank you for your talk. It was fantastic. And I wish us all a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thanks for your attention. Bye bye.